Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's Free CompTIA A Plus Certification Training Course on an Overview of Memory. I'm James Messer. And in this module, we're going to talk about CompTIA A Plus 220-701 Section 1.6, which really goes into a lot of memory characteristics, memory types. We're going to learn about parity versus non-parity. We're going to look at ECC versus non-ECC, what the difference is between single-sided and double-sided, and the difference between single channel and dual channel. There's also some things we need to consider about the speed of memory and how it operates. Let's start our conversation with our, about how memory actually works. If you look at a computer at a, at a very architectural level, you know that you've got a CPU inside of it. That's kind of where the whole process begins inside of our computer. Our CPU generally is connected to what we call a north bridge or memory controller hub via something called a front side bus or an FSB. The front side bus is usually very, very fast because there's constant communication between our memory controller hub and the CPU. But of course, the memory controller hub itself has to get the information to and from the memory. And so there are memory addresses down here in our memory banks themselves. We're putting these slots are set up on our motherboard to stick our memory modules themselves. And the memory communicates back to the north bridge through something called the memory bus. So we've got all of these memory chips down here. They're constantly communicating back to something that's controlling the communication between the CPU and the memory. This is perhaps one of the most critical components inside of our computer as it relates to speed. We want to be sure that that bus and the memory that we have is able to operate as fast as it can with the CPU that's in our system. Those are really working in tandem. And we want to be sure our FSB runs as fast as it can go. The memory that we're putting into the system is maximized for the specifications of our entire computer, and that our CPU isn't having to wait on memory to be able to operate. There's many different kinds of memory inside of our computer. A very common one is on the CPU itself. We have memory on the CPU that is storing information in something we call registers, which is this place that the CPU uses when it's performing its calculations. It needs a place to have a register that it's adding or subtracting or multiplying or performing a calculation from. And it needs somewhere to put the answer once it's done. And it uses registers for other things in between. It's a temporary storage location that is used really just for the CPU. Also on the CPU is something called cache memory. If you go back and look at one of our videos we did on CPU technologies, you know that cache memory is very, very fast. And it usually resides right on the motherboard on the CPU chip itself. So it's not something that's put off external to the CPU. It's right there because it's very, very fast. And we want to be sure that we're able to access it without having to go out over the bus to be able to do that. There's also some cache that sits offside, outside of the CPU. And occasionally, you'll see that being used as well. And of course, there's a bus connection to that particular cache memory. Generally, when we're putting memory modules into our computer, those modules are dynamic random access memory modules, or DRAM, that DRAM. That, that dynamic memory and the way that we access that dynamic memory in those, those uh, modules that we put in is probably one of the most common ways that we use, us human beings, are using the memory inside of our computer. And the paging systems and virtual memory you'll also see referenced as well. This may not be actual memory chips in silicon. This may be using a section of your hard drive to take information out of that memory and put it somewhere temporarily to store it so that we're freeing up more space in that active RAM. That active silicon memory is where everything happens. So the more that we have available, the better off we're going to be when we're performing our functions in our spreadsheets or working on word processing documents or working on a video like this. There are a number of operational concepts you need to know about how memory works and some of the underlying capabilities of memory. One is the way that we transfer memory back and forth inside of our computer. And generally, it's referred to as the bandwidth of the memory transfer inside of our computer. And that's really referring to how wide this bus is that we can send this memory information back and forth. Every clock cycle inside of your computer, you're able to send information across that bus. The wider the bus, the more you'll be able to transfer your through your computer at any particular time. Generally, we look at memory bandwidth that's a particular size. It's 8 bits wide, or it's 64 bits wide. And that's referring to how much we can shove down that bus at any one clock 
cycle. It's also referring to generally the width of our memory modules. We want to be sure our memory modules are able to take advantage of these memory buses that we have on our computers. The number of chips, if you were able to look at a memory module, don't really mean very much. They're not referring to the amount of memory on a, on a particular chip. You really can't tell by looking at it how much the, the bus that that particular memory is going to be able to use. You always have to look at the specifications for that memory module to really know how it's going to operate. We spoke earlier of that dynamic random access memory. Generally, that memory is synchronized with a clock that's on a bus and where everything is in synchronization when it's sending information back and forth. So you'll occasionally see that SDRAM, synchronous dynamic random access memory, as the things that you will be purchasing to put inside of your computer or to upgrade the memory inside of your computer. And it usually talks about the speed of that memory measured in something of megabytes per second. You'll also see it registered as something related to clock speed. So if you see something that's a 100 megahertz memory bus, you may see the memory referred to as PC100. If you're using some of the newer memory, like DDR2, DDR3, or the DDR memory that's there, usually you're talking about the throughput of that memory. And you'll see it measured that way. So if the DDR2 memory can go 3,200 megabytes per second, then you'll see it registered as something like a PC2-3200. Just another naming convention we use when you're looking at the memory and you see this is PC3 in a number or PC2 in a number, that's what it's talking about, is being able to view it as the total throughput available for that memory. Another specification for memory you want to think about is memory latency. You'll see this referred to as an abbreviation called CAS, which stands for both column address strobe. You'll also see it referred to as column address select. And there's a number called a, a, a CAS latency, or a CL. And that's referring to the clock cycles between when a memory request is sent and between the time that we receive the data. So what you want is a low amount of latency there. The lower the number, the fewer clock cycles have to go by, and the faster that the overall throughput of your computer is going to be. So if you see something that's a DDR2 memory running at 667 megahertz, and you see that the CL is equal to 4, that's going to be faster than if it's the same memory where the CL is going to be equal to 5.